Welcome to this series of podcasts on the beauty and power of liturgical art. Created through the Chichester Workshop for Liturgical Art and our associates, we explore how God reveals himself to us through the material world and how we, as a union of matter and spirit, can worship God through works of material beauty. Greetings, listeners. I have with me a, a dear old friend and my new assistant priest, our father, Pantelaimon Baxfield. We've known each other for a long, long time, since you're probably one year old, I think. <laughs> probably. I can um, remember you would give me airplane rides, so sure I was very small. Yeah, I remember those days. They were great when I was stronger. So Father has been a deacon for many years in this parish I attend in Shrewsbury, um, when he was recently made a, a priest. Um, his father is the founder priest, Father Stephen, and we now have Father Pantelaimon. He's a great preacher. We had a wonderful sermon last Sunday. Um, now the subject we want to cover just now is how a priest or other moving people in a parish can brief liturgical artists. This is really important because... Uh, Particularly with architects, we don't have many specialist church architects. Um, so a big onus, therefore, is on the priest or the committee how to brief the architects so that they know what the objective of their new church or church refurbishment or church extension is. So it just happens that because our church is not an enormous church um, and our parish is growing, literally bursting at the door, I think, we have to have a lot of people outside often, we wish to extend the church and also extend um, to the south to create some community space. So I wanted to talk with Father Pantelaimon, who's also a land surveyor, so an expert on, on this field. Um, what principles he's finding are important in, in briefing and, and forming architects, uh, what, they, what we want as a parish so that they can hopefully first or second time get what we're after. So perhaps you could give a little background first, Father, what we're aiming for in this extension and the processes and um, how successful you think um, we've been, what you've learned from this whole process. Okay, yes. Um, so the requirement uh, is fairly simple. As you've said, the church is far too small. Uh, we have no other fellowship space, no meeting space to meet as a community. Um, apart from outside the church or within the church. Um, so we need more space. Um, and that's, that's the top, top requirement. But uh, once you get into the needs and um, all of the, the elements which make up what the, um, the extension is going to be, um, there's a huge, the, the list of requirements grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. And grows. Um, so the, the first principle would probably be to make sure that you've got all of your requirements mm -hmm. of what you need um, your extension, your project to, to deliver, to be listed out. Um, and how did you decide those? Well, we had a long, long list, um, and was we it went through. You an individual? How, how did it, that it was, it, develop? There was a, a small um, subcommittee yeah. um, that worked reporting to the board, um, but they took leadership of of listing out the requirements. Okay. The requirements is a there's input from the com, the main committee of the church, but also, uh, for instance, the the Philip Dokos committee who organize events and need a good kitchen, they, they want to input their requirements. Um, and then the architects have their requirements. So it all goes into, it's, it's, a, it's a corporate um, document, but it needs, it needs to be led. And it was led in our instance by um, the subcommittee who made sure that we um, elected you know, all of the opinions of others we knew who to ask to get that information to go into. So apart the from the practical requirements, toilets, kitchenette, whatever, how specific did you find you had to be with, as it were, how should we say, more stylistic requirements or liturgical requirements? Mm. Because you can make a concrete box that served those practical functions perfectly yeah. well, but obviously doesn't serve things aesthetically. So how... Specific, did you find you had to be in terms of materials or whatever? Um, yes. Well, this has been <laughs> this has been a huge challenge for mm -hmm. us because mm -hmm. actually, um, 
the sort of architect that you have to appoint um, uh, to be able to work with such a, such a project is is very specific, and and I I wonder whether there's a need um, for specialists in this in this field, specialist liturgical architects. Mm -hmm. But even then, with an Orthodox church, you you actually need specialist Orthodox liturgical architects because it is so complicated. Mm -hmm. You can't just there's, with with an Orthodox church, you can't just design how you think it might look great from the outside. The lighting, the um, the stone, whether it's stone, the way that things are carved, the way that you treat the materials, it's completely different to if you're just building an office block or a new public building. Mm. So this is jumping the game going forward, looking for the future. What you said is very interesting to me that we do need specialists in church architecture and then even if you have one specialist in church architecture he or she needs to know the different demands of different yeah. congregations or different denominations say because the worship is different therefore the demands are different it's interesting do you think it'd be sufficient as it were to do top-up training of someone who's already got their um their professional training as an architect and then have subsidiary mm -hmm. courses to help them understand at least some of the basic demands of church architecture in general and of specific congregations? How, how would one go about training or supplementing existing training? I, I think it, it's essential, um, is the reality. Uh, not, a, not only the training, but also the experience of different, different uh, buildings. For instance, we know we both know of an architect at the, at the moment who's on his way over to northern Mac Macedonia and uh, the Balkans to study. Uh, he's a sp specialist liturgical architect. He's studying the raw materials, as it were, in the country where the traditions of the Orthodox churches that he's now designing across the world uh, started. So um, it, it's not something that it, it's... It's got to be learned uh -huh. um, through through an understanding of the worship, uh, whatever the different w worship it is, whatever de denomination, the pati particularities of peculiarities of the particular worship um, demand a particular design. Mm -hmm. And unless you understand that and are trained in um, how the building, as we're talking about architecture. How the building has got to respond to those liturgical needs, you're you're floundering. Mm. So, given that we don't have many or any in this country that are specialists, we do have quite a few Anglican and Catholic architects. I think who have some experience of this. But mm. the onus seems to be more and more on the commissioners, i.e., the priests or the committee. So, could you guide us through some of the principles you have found? I for example, there's a difference between telling what you need and how to go about that. Sometimes we have a very specific idea of how we want something to be done, whereas really we need to brief them saying what effect we want, but to see what the architect comes up with as to how that objective is achieved. But could you, could you outline some principles for listeners who find themselves in the situation? They need to brief an architect who may be a brilliant architect, but has very little experience. What guidance? What Guidelines should be given to them. Yes. Well, as num number one would be to make sure that uh, they understand very, very well the the liturgical requirements and the overall um, aesthetic that is that is uh, needs to be um, imbued into the into the stones, the concrete, whatever it might be, to support that worship. And how could we, we help them do that? I think it's really important that they actually understand understand the worship, what's going on inside the building, how, where the um, where the congregation are standing, um, at what point are the priests or deacons moving through the church. They've got, they've got to understand this. Um, Perhaps we ought to invite them as part of the brief to come to one service at least. De definitely. I think that would be really, mm. really fundamental um, because if they don't understand what, what's going on and the atmosphere that is it's, you need to create inside an Orthodox church to be conducive to worship, 
um, it's very difficult for mm. them to understand then what, how it needs to be designed for mm. the lighting and uh, um, making sure there's the space in the right places and the view angle of views are right. Mm. Um, and I know architects often like to do something that's really modern that has their sort of stamp on. Um, and sometimes that can work quite well. Sometimes mm. it can look a bit of a pastiche to that and an old looking thing to an old building. Um, but on the other hand, it's got to harmonize, and I suppose orthodox anyway, but more sort of conservative in, 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 in that respect. I don't know if that's true or not, but we tend to be. So with our extension, I think we thought stone, um, or stone perhaps and render might, might be a good material. Um, so I think, I think uh, one of the difficulties is, is how to be authentic and not be pastiche, but on the other hand, um, you have to be humble enough as it were, to do something that doesn't shout, look at me, it's something novel, that actually does the job and isn't too noticeable. Mm. Like I suppose in a, in a choir, you can have someone who's just really noticeable as an individual and they swamp the others, so somehow there's got to be some sort of unity. Yes. Um, well, it, it's, it's possible, as you say, to achieve something like this uh, with, with modern design. And in fact, there are some very good examples. You can go to Lincoln Cathedral, for instance, mm. and um, where they've got the old cathedral, <coughs> they've connected it with the chapter house with a very modern extension. But that extension was designed for, um, for, the, for the community, for community project, community space. The litur um, when there's design for <coughs> a liturgical space, particularly with the Orthodox Church, the requirements are you you're very close to having to be in a pastiche um, to creating a pastiche because actually those arches that are um, you know they they're medieval. That's what people associate with an Orthodox church. You go into uh, the the churches that are being built, brand new churches that are being built in America or in Cyprus, all have those arches. Mm -hmm. um, and if they're brand new buildings, they all have a dome. Um, there are some commonalities between as far west as you can go and as far east as you can go. Mm -hmm. And um, so we here are working with a an early English <clears throat> church, um, one of our challenges is that it's grade two star listed and we want to take out the entire west wall. And the reason for that is because if we don't take out the west wall, those people on the other side of the west wall are not part of the, mm. part of the worship here. Um, so that was a, a huge challenge and, and the architects um, had to be helped over that <laughs> hurdle. So, Oh no, going too <laughs> radical. Going, it's too radical. Um, but actually, uh, historic England, when the plans were put to them for pre-application, um, they said, "Well, we are not. We are not going to um, object to taking out the West Wall because basically you're continuing to use that building as a place of worship." So they saw the worship as the Mm. as the number one thing mm. and in fact they made some comments to the architects to say that it that what had been designed was needed to be more ecclesiastical that's very interesting this is particularly so, the extension in the south yeah, yeah. make it more ecclesiastical yeah, yeah. interesting normally one associates a stock England with putting the brakes on things but there they're saying actually yeah. no no, yeah. no it was it. And, yeah a friend um, suggested that perhaps a document could be produced that could be used by a lot of churches and you'd make white one specifically for Orthodox, one for Anglicans, one for Catholic. There mm. could be uh, a document that could be given to any architect as part of the brief, um, just outlining basic liturgical requirements, principles, yeah. of something that's authentic, but, but not so novel perhaps that it attracts attention to itself, whatever, whatever these principles are that mm. requires work. But that seemed like a good idea. No, definitely. To me. Yeah. Um, it could help our priests. I mean, you're a surveyor, so you think this way, but most priests wouldn't be involved in that building work, so there'd be a bit of a loss out of brief an architect. So I think it might be a long document. There would be several <laughs> chapters. Um, yeah, yes, that would be definitely. Anyway.
Yeah, because you know, you'd start off with what what the worship was. Try and describe mm -hmm. some of it. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe have a link to a few videos yes. um, yeah. for them to watch. Yeah. Um, and maybe when you're talking about lighting, have have uh, videos again of what that lighting, what that atmosphere with the incense and the, the rays of light coming through the incense and. Uh, Could you talk a bit about it? lighting? I've been doing quite a bit of research. On this myself, I was asked a few years ago to be a consultant on the Russian Orthodox Cathedral refurbishment. An oligarch was giving a lot of money for this, so basically money wasn't a, a great objective. So um, they had a really good lighting technician, but I think he wasn't briefed particularly well, so he treated it like a museum effectively and had lighting all over the place and showing up all the architectural details. But um, it didn't create a liturgical atmosphere, so this only think about Lighting is actually a form of iconography, mm -hmm. uh, a very important part of creating an atmosphere of soul, a state of soul. I've noticed going into most monastic churches, the light is quite low, mm -hmm. and therefore um, the emphasis through the oil lamps is on the faces. So you enter these churches with lower um, ambient light, and you notice first not the church building, but the faces of the saints. Yes. Because these lights are close to the faces, and then you notice the arches and all the rest of the stuff. So that really revealed to me the importance of, of light. But we assume now um, we've got to have lots of light because people have got to read the hymns. But of course, we don't have hymn books, so you don't need that ambient light. Um, no, well, there are, yes, you go into um, particularly monastic churches, and there are little pockets of light, mm. and they draw you into particular places. So, for instance, the um, the icon of the feast, or quite quite often in uh, particularly in Cyprus, where all of the monasteries are named after Panagia of of something or other, mm -hmm. so there, there's always an icon of Panagia close to the um, middle of the church, <coughs> uh, with with lots of lamps hanging, and um, you're drawn in to go mm -hmm. and go and visit uh, Panagia before you go off and look at the rest of the church, um, and then there's always one vigil lamp kept a light on the on the holy table or behind the holy table so you even when there's not a service going on you mm. you can see some light coming out of the, the the altar area so on a brief the purpose of lighting but if you're quite clear really i think there might be a slight distinction between <clears throat> monastic churches which tend to be a lower ambient light and mm. <clears throat> parish churches but still a parish church should have not generally so much ambient light that basically the oil lamps make no difference so that there's no focus on the icons. Yeah. I well, we have no, um, apart from when the uh, chanters <clears throat> need light to be able to see the, the books, um, we don't have any electrical lighting in this church at mm -hmm. all. Um, and it it helps, you know, during Lenten services, for instance, when it's dark in the evening, um, it's and you've only got the lights, the lamps, the oil lamps on the iconostasis. You, you know, it, it helps create a sense of humility and prayerfulness and. Not thinking about all the things that you can see around you, you're you're focused on, focus on God. Yeah. The lower light actually does focus you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, so in a minute, I'm going to pass you over to Heather Pollington, who's one of my icon students, who's an expert in designing sets, fabrics for for top class films. So she's in a sense working in the same field um, of liturgical art, but in the showbiz world. But the principles are very similar: how to brief how to design, how much detail to put in for people making it. Um, but before that, just to summarize what we said, I think, first of all, briefing is really difficult. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a big thing. It's, you need communication with the architect, choose your architect well, um, include lighting in your brief, uh, encourage them to have at least some experience of um, liturgical worship, so it's not all theoretical. Be as, um, as specific as possible, but without taking the taking all of the creativity away from the architect. Yep. Yep. Good. Excellent. Thank you. It's remarkable talking with your father and I'm going to um, hand over to 
um, Heather now, and she's going to be speaking with you a little bit. Thank you. So uh, we've just been talking about the uh, the projects that we have of um, extending the church here, and um, what how important it is to get your briefing right to to an architect, and um, how the the communication of what you want and what it's all going to look like and 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 the effect you're going to achieve is right for liturgical worship. Yeah. But Heather, you um, you you work in the film industry and uh, you're creating creating sets for some some amazing films where again it's about um, getting the the atmosphere and the um, the set right for those actors. Um, can you can you tell us what what you might be able to uh, help and share with us as as liturgical artists briefers um, that might might help? Um, yeah, I think there are some principles that that could be transferable to this situation. Um, so normally, when I work on a film, we start off at the beginning with just the script, and the first thing we look at really is, you know. What is the scene? Um, what is the movement of the actors? Um, that's that's really the first principle because it's all about you know how how things move through space and and story and action. And I think uh, listening to you talking to Aidan, um, that's really the first principle that you need to describe, which is the movement mm. um, of this church. It you know in um, the Orthodox faith is quite different to an Anglican church. So if you're working with English architects, they'll assume you know you might be talking about a space with pews um, and they need to understand how it's different you know um, it's it's it, it's much less restricted um, because it, it has many more functions um, so that would be the first thing and then the other thing to say is you know when I work on films um, you know I, I tend to spend kind of 10 months on each film and each time we're learning a different language you know one film we might be Victorian England, the next one might be sci-fi. And so um, you'd think, well, how does everyone learn that language very quickly? Um, but they do, and, and the way that we do it is really through um, familiarising ourselves with the language, studying, but then also really, really good communication and a lot of investment in good relationships. So uh, a film is a huge collaboration between lots of different parties. You know, you've got all the technicians, you've got obviously directors, you've got, um, you know, set designers like um, my department, and um, we all need to work together to achieve this, this goal. Um, so we really need to get on. Um, we're under huge time pressure, huge um, financial pressure. Usually, we, you know, we have sometimes uh, just a couple of months to get ready and build everything. Um, so the right. best kind of lubricant for that is, is you know, really listen to each other and, uh, and have that vision uh, that collective vision at the outset of what we're trying to achieve um, and try to put egos aside, you know, in, in um, pursuit of this, of this goal. Um, so that's how we do it. And then once we start the process, uh, we're listening to each other. The most valuable thing is um, visual reference because it's really the best way for people to understand what that vision is. You know, you can talk to people, but really showing them examples <clears throat> of things that you like. So from your side, you know, it might be um, examples of existing churches. We talked maybe, you talked to Aidan about maybe having a document, you know, that could outline, you know, just the, 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 the basic plan of an Orthodox church. And, you know, historically, I think people would be interested and surprised to learn what that is and how that structure might be different from, from English churches. Um, and then also you know, visual references of things that you like. And then on the architect side, I think they, again, they need to they need to communicate with you in a visual form in response to that and show you drawings. Um, you know, the, the way that we do it in film is with digital visualization. So the director will say, I'm imagining this. And then we, as the art department, come back with, Okay, do you mean this? Yes. Is, is this how it's going to look? And then the director will say yes and approve it. And at that point, then we go and direct all the um, all all the suppliers, all the uh, you know construction crew, and everything that you know. Director has approved this. 
and therefore they all know what we're doing and everything gets detailed out. So the world of film is very chaotic, but through this kind of very systematic approach, things get done and things get done largely correctly. Um, and everyone's happy because they understand the expectations. Um, and what when it goes wrong is when people make assumptions. So they'll say something and they'll assume that person understands. And then, it, then that person goes off and builds something and it's completely wrong. And then, you know, tensions can arise. So um, it's always best to, like I say, communicate well and then just detail, detail, assume nothing. Um, everything, you know, needs to get approved and signed off. So you would be the director, ultimately. Um, and the, the architect's playing a similar role to the designers on a, on a film. Um, so, yeah, our, our, what we do is a kind of very smaller version that only lasts for a few months, but um, as a kind of a condensed experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm just wondering whether there could be anything taken from that. Well, the fact is... Um... I suppose our, our job is a bit easier because it's not an imagination of of uh, of um, what it's meant to look like. It's there are some examples, and yes. you can you can really uh, pin the ideas onto what already exists. So there's a, there's a wealth of of experience which architects can can um, absorb before they start putting pen to pen to paper, it's not what the director says, well I imagine the sci-fi no. set to be, but so therefore, yeah, it's, but it's similar, um, you know, that's, that communication, it's, it's something we've, um, I guess, struggled with because the architects want to try and have their own creativity, mm -hmm. and so therefore when they when they start going down a route that makes it look too much like how an Orthodox church might look elsewhere in the world, whether it's a, right. a Romanesque church in in the UK or or a Byzantine church in Greece or a new modern um, Orthodox church in in America, yeah, it's um it's just taking a little too much of something else, and they want to have their own. I, <laughs> but, but I understand. It's, um, it's, yeah. it's it's interesting, you know, that uh, bringing bringing all of the parties to play to make sure that you get exactly what is in what is needed for that particular community, that com particular uh, worshiping congregation at that at that point. It's 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 um, it's amazing. But it, yeah, I I I hear what you're saying. I think um, that. <laughs> If the relationship is good, there there can be room for those elements. And mm -hmm. I'm talking about, you know, detailing everything down to kind of paint swatches and just getting involved in all of those details. And then, you know, like I said, if you're getting on well, you you're going to allow maybe for a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of their um, their innovation. But I think if you're the paying client. Um, there has to be an understanding that they're building a church for you and your community, mm. and that's really the that's really the essential um, driving force behind all the decisions. Um, and that's definitely the way we operate in film. Um, it's all about you know you, we're all in service to producing this story basically, and I, and I see really that um, that attitude should absolutely be respond. Yes, responding mm. to a need. Um, um, so I suppose what you're saying about architecture is because architecture has gone in a different direction in this country, you know, traditionally that's how it would have always been. Mm. But now, you know, like you say, it's architect as kind of as artist and, and so you're dealing with um, um, an industry that has been operating in that way where they've been awarded for innovation and now you're trying to bring them into a kind of more traditional way of working, yeah. which is much more... It's against the grain. Yes, yeah. Because it's reusing techniques that were in use thousands, thousands of years ago, and yeah. hundreds of years ago. Yeah. Uh, why, why do that when we can just slap a bit of steel in and make it look nice on the outside? But I suppose if you can make this extension work really well, it will become celebrated, and so and Absolutely. therefore. It can be uh, a blueprint for future projects. 
so I'm sure it's uh, it's it's challenging, but I, I think it's going to be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> When we can fit another hundred people in, it will be worth it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thank you.